Fantastic. So everybody present. My computer speaking at me in Dutch. I'm here in the Netherlands at the moment. Um, and so I will be talking today about automating API style guides. Um, my name is Phil Sturgeon, known as Crashy McSiderface on the internet. Um, and I generally talk about APIs, crashing bikes, and trying to save the planet. Uh, if you want to find me, I'm at Phil Sturgeon on all the things. So I work for a company called Stoplight, who uh, is working on making a bunch of tooling to help you make APIs that are better and make them faster and stronger. Um, and one of the tools, uh, one of the things, one of the things that I personally have a, a big stake in is is trying to help people build good quality APIs. I wrote a book, Build APIs You Won't Hate, because everyone builds an API and then they hate it. Um, and one of the biggest problems that I come across is people never really know what to name things. They don't know what data format to use. And, and so when you have a company with a lot of APIs, right, in that last talk, um, we saw that the number of APIs is just skyrocketing. People are making more and more and more. And, Instead of having, instead of a company having one API, now you might have a hundred, right? Because people are doing microservices, and um, and so when you have a bunch of different developers, if if you ask a hundred different developers how to make an API, you're going to get a hundred and five different opinions because people just change their minds all the time. Um, so inconsistency can take the form of like random naming conventions and endpoints and parameters, uh, different entire formats being used, like uh, how JSON API, Siren, or a series of different custom snowflakes that all differ from each other, and and even different from uh, even one API can have different data formats in different versions of itself. So if you talk to version two and version three, you get completely different uh, shapes of responses, let alone the data. Um, and a bunch of different APIs can use different security schemes or unconventional status codes. You might have um, something sending errors on a 200 because they're wild like that, and but other ones use actual status codes. So um, it can be really hard to kind of build up any conventions if, if things are super inconsistent, right? Um, but beyond the consistency just feeling nice, um, inconsistency isn't really about, you know, just wanting to feel nice. It, it's uh, developers can make assumptions. Your consumers can make assumptions, which cause mistakes. Um, if if they're worried about making mistakes or because they've been burned uh, on that recently, they're going to constantly be rechecking your documentation, which is wasting a lot of time for them. So that's like more time they could have spent successfully integrating with your with your API and, and creating products that make you money. Um, they can't reuse generic code between different APIs, which is super unfortunate. You have to build custom things for every API you integrate with. Um, and, and and also it can just look silly if you've got, you know, five different APIs you expose to a, to different people and they all look different. You just kind of look like you're half-assing things. So um, you don't want to do that. And, and it can all just lead to a, a bad developer experience in general. Right? Uh, something I have seen happen time and time and time again, because not only do I work at Stoplight helping them build tools, but I, I run a, like a support group for API developers um, on, on APIs you won't hate Slack channel. Um, and I also do a lot of consulting for people. And a really common problem is something as simple as uh, an error message sometimes is a string and sometimes is an object of a load of other stuff. Um, and somebody might have seen a few errors come back from API A and a few other APIs in the company, but then API B does an object. And what happens when you do this? You see errors like this. <laughs> um, you just see object, object, because JavaScript. So you want to try and avoid stuff like this. And you want to standardize um, uh, your APIs. But standardizing APIs that already exist is quite a hard job. Um, if something is already in production and you want to change it to make it be consistent, there's not much business value to doing that because you've already got an API. You'd have to change an API, which involves breaking your consumers. Um, so are you going to make a V2 just so that you can make things consistent? Or are you going to wait for V2 to happen and then have eventual consistency? Um, are you going to duplicate endpoints via evolution and then kind of just make those new ones be nice and, and consistent? Or uh, some people genuinely build backends for front ends almost entirely for this reason. Uh, there's a lot of different reasons that you should or should not use BFFs in various different contexts, but I personally feel like having a really inconsistent ecosystem is not <laughs> a reason to do it. Um, and other people just casually recommend rewriting everything in GraphQL or gRPC or Vulkan or some other twerp or whatever. 
Um, and again, there's a lot of reasons to use these things, and there's a lot of reasons to maybe rewrite an entire ecosystem, but having inconsistent APIs is, is not that reason. Um, if you're a bit of a visual thinker, look at it like this. You've got a bunch of different APIs, and you've got a client that's talking to them, and they're all completely different from each other, different data formats, um, different error formats, different uh, authentication schemes, right? One's uh, HTTP digest, the other one's OAuth, the other one's whatever, um, uh, open API. And so that client has got to build a whole bunch of code uh, to, to handle all of that. And that, that client is fairly fed up with having to do that. So that client might build a BFF, and then that client can talk to that one API that they control, which has got nice, consistent, just one way of handling authentication. They don't have to have five different sessions managed. Um, and, and that's great for them. But uh, when you have a bunch of different clients, then they all end up building their own BFFs. And this might sound silly, um, but when I was working at my last company, we had hundreds of APIs and, and loads of different clients, un unbeknownst to other teams, were all building their own BFFs so that they could have a consistent experience. And so we were basically um, like, it's not even squaring, right? It's just, we were creating so much more technology and wasting so much time creating all of these kind of duplicate but slightly different APIs just so things can be consistent. You kind of wonder, why don't we just make the APIs be consistent in the first place? And there's a lot of ways you can do this too, which aren't quite so wasteful. Um, we just learned a whole bunch about API gateways, and that's absolutely right. Um, an API gateway can solve a whole bunch of problems. Um, how you handle it, uh, rate limiting, how you handle caching, how you handle authentication can be made consistent across all of them. So maybe API A, B, and C were built in different different programming languages with different frameworks, with different popular, popular authentication tools, and, and the authentication logic was built into the, the code base, but you can just delete that code and, and you know, handle it carefully, but you can move the authentication to the API gateway, and that will create a lot of consistency across your APIs, but not everything can be handled that way. Like if you have wildly different naming conventions for your endpoints and your properties, then an API gateway won't solve that. It's just part of the equation. So how do we solve the rest of it? Uh, design guidelines. I first came across the concept of API design guidelines um, on apistylebook.com. And there's a bunch of these websites. Um, sorry, there's a there's a bunch of companies who have posted their idea of what they want an API to be, uh, what they consider to be a good API. They're not speaking definitively, um, but they are. They're writing down all of the decisions and opinions that they've made of how to make good quality standard APIs, and then they share them with other people. So they can use that internally, and other people can use it if they like. Um, and this is everything from um, Adidas, Atlassian. Uh, Microsoft, PayPal, White House, <laughs> the White House did one, that was uh, Obama <laughs> era. Um, I don't know what the current opinions are on, on APIs, but um, yeah, there's a bunch of them on there and Heroku, it's a really good place to get started. Um, if you're Googling for style guides, then they come under a lot of different names. Some people call them design guide or design guidelines or style guide or style book. They're all basically the same thing. Uh, so James Higginbottom uh, wrote a great article about it, and it will come up in your Googling. Um, the goal for your API style guide should be to advise teams designing APIs towards a more consistent API with other APIs across the organization. So, um, you know, some old APIs may not match this style guide, but over time, um, new APIs and new functionality and new versions of those APIs will eventually become uh, consistent. And some of the things that you might want to create rules for, uh, I personally recommend using RFC 7807 for errors, right? Instead of 25 different error formats and every single API doing them slightly differently, you can use this one uh, standard that has been written for error formats. Um, you don't need to make decisions when there's already a standard for it. You can just use the standard. Um, you can use UUID for um, IDs and URLs and bodies to avoid having like to avoid exposing auto incrementing IDs and having people plus one, plus two, plus three, plus four, and download your entire data set. You can create all these rules um, for things that make for a good API. And you can avoid the need to like educate a lot of developers because as we said, there's so many people getting into API development. They don't have time to learn everything. I, I don't, I, I'd love it if every single API developer read my book and a bunch of other books and, and just really learned how to do everything really well. But you don't always have time to do that. And so if you can kind of create a style guide that just says, do this, you'll avoid this problem. They don't necessarily need to learn everything about the API world. They just learn this one thing. 
Um, and so creating um, get slash helps Hatios. Uh, creating get slash health helps monitoring. Posts should return 201 or 202 and errors should not be on 200, right? All these things can just be written into a style guide so that people just do it. Problem is a lot of people use for, for a long time, all of those websites I, I mentioned, they're all just a website, uh, some sort of documentation, a CMS, a wiki. Some people make like a Google slideshow or keynote. Uh, other people use random PDFs. I've seen spreadsheets of style guides, which is super weird. Um, at, or example, open API files, like uh, Salesforce do this, a few other companies do this. They just make one uh, like de facto open API file that has a lot of good ideas written in it and some comments, I guess. And then everyone goes to check that now and then. Um, but it's that none of these solutions are machine readable or particularly useful apart from a human being staring at it. And Honestly, most developers aren't going to read the entire manifesto. If you have a hundred developers and you spend this long time building an API style guide, they're not all going to read it. And if they do, they won't remember it in a month or six months or a year. And if they, you know, even if they do remember exactly what you wrote when you first wrote it, they're not going to reread it every single month looking for new rules and new suggestions and new ideas that you've put in. So that stuff gets out of date pretty quick. Um, I did a very highly scientific Twitter poll which had 78 replies. Uh, and I basically asked people, how do they approach their API style guide? Do they have, mo most people don't have one. 20% um, on, on website, a couple of, a surprising number with the example open API. And only 11% of people um, do uh, or API linter rule set. And that's what we can talk about now. The two types of rules that you might wanna create, you can cr help people create better open API or you can help people create better APIs. Um, so the open API is describing an API. You can either give people feedback on the open API they've written and be like, hey, why didn't you add some descriptions to your parameters so that people know what this thing actually does? Um, and that makes better documentation. Or you can suggest that people add uh, default and example values. So that creates better mocks when you run it through something like Prism. Um, but you can also suggest people make better APIs by looking at the API that open API is describing and complaining if they use a non-standard naming convention for the endpoints or the properties, or they use some sort of crap security approach. Um, so you can, you can do both. And if you've used Stoplight Studio, you might be fairly familiar with some of this. Uh, this is the editor that we use so that you don't have to like hand wrangle your own YAML. Um, Spectral in Stoplight has a default open API rule set and it will give you a bunch of errors like this. Um, basically, it gives you a bunch of feedback on, on what it thinks is good open API. So it reminds you about features a lot of people forget about, like tags and descriptions, and it will just help you make better stuff. And you can tweak that default rule set, or you can totally replace it, and you can go um, as creative as you want with custom rules. And so this uh, Spectral is the engine for this under the hood. Um, this is one I, I made. Uh, a rule called API home, you must have a root path, right? It's just gotta be there. An extension to that is um, API home get. So if you have uh, a get, if you have a, a root one, it needs to have a get. Um, you can get really creative with this stuff. Uh, you can say all paths should be kebab case, which is kind of lowercase and hyphenated. And so you can use these built-in functions. We have a function called casing, function options. The type is kebab and you can change the, the thing to, slashes so that you can have something slash something slash. Um, this amazing one from uh, Lorna Mitchell and Michael Heap is suggesting that people, this is a, a JSON path. If you're familiar with the syntax, if you're not, you can Google JSON path. So given uh, this JSON path, um, you can say the version number of my open API file must be semver. So it, it uses regex here, everyone's favorite to make sure there's three numbers. Um, this this rule will basically deny HTTP basic. So it will look at the components, it will look at the security schemas, and if any of them, uh, if the scheme uh, of the scheme field matches basic, it will say boo, no, don't don't do that. Use something else. Um, this is an example. This one is a little wild. Uh, errors should support either RFC seven eight zero seven or JSON API errors. That's we work we had two different error formats that are in popular contention and i'd rather you people used one or the other instead of infinite possibilities so in this one you can say um look at all the paths um look at their responses 
And if uh, uses a little bit of regex on a filter, <laughs> if the uh, status code starts with four or five, so an error, uh, look at the content and then uh, look to see the keys of that content. And is it um, JSON API or problem XML or problem JSON? So those are the allowed MIME types. I asked the community for their rules um, and some really interesting ones popped up. Um, this one, patch request content type. So it will throw an error if, uh, if looking in the paths, if all the paths, the property uh, is equal to patch and the request body has content, which is equal to application JSON, then it will fail um, because paths, uh, sorry, patch cannot use application JSON. Why? Well, they have this other suggestion here, which is uh, we prefer application slash merge hyphen patch uh, for patch requests. So a lot of API developers have never heard of uh, merge patch, but now you have, you have an error showing up in your editor telling you to go check that out. So now you have something to Google for, and it's just a, a nice way of handling patch. Uh, and even more events, if you don't want to mess around with that DSL or the DSL isn't powerful enough, you can't use those keywords and the, the built-in functions to achieve whatever your goal is. Um, you can write your own custom functions and uh, you can wrap, package all spectral rule sets up in an NPM, um, uh, NPM module or uh, you, you can do plain text YAML if you're just using the DSL, but if you want to use custom JavaScript functions, you have to package that as an NPM module. Um, but this one, write good, is basically a uh, I think English like dictionary checker, and it basically checks to see if you have written valid English, and if you haven't, then it will fail. Um, so this 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 rule is used to say like it must be valid English, which you can use for names and summaries and things like that. So. If you're using Stoplight Studio, then any of these custom rules, any of these custom functions will show up just like any other function. Um, and it would be baked right in. So while people are working on editing uh, in Stoplight Studio, they'll get feedback on that. And we're working on making it show up in the form, like in the GUI version as well. So uh, whether you're using code view or form view, you'll see these errors. Um, but more interestingly than just being in Studio, uh, Spectral CLI, it exists so you can run this as continuous integration you can run it in your dev environment you can run it wherever you want and you can make sure that the open api and json schema and async api it supports loads of different formats you can even define your own formats but um, you can make sure that the uh the api description matches the api style guide um so here i have an api so you won't hate dot yaml which is one i'm creating i'll i'll share this and there'll be uh, there'll be links to my talk on on twitter if you follow me um, but basically, it's a bunch of rules and functions that, that are very opinionated um, that tell you how to make a better API. And so here's an example of that rule saying on line 19, uh, we have a warning saying, hey, don't use HTTP basic, right? So this rule will show up in the CLI. Um, we also have VS Code Spectral. So if you don't feel like using Stoplight Studio, um, you can just download this. Or if it's not even for open API, you can use it for anything. I use it for you know, messing with Kubernetes files with a style guide. You can create a style guide for anything, but um, you can basically say, hey, what's that HTTP basic doing there? Please get rid of that. And if you hover over, you'll get an error too. Um, and there's also a spectral GitHub action. So you can create this one rule set and then use it in all the different places. So no one's ever going to miss anything. Um, and it's important to point out that like API design reviews are never going to be completely replaced by automation, right? Right now, most API reviews are handled by a team of like API gatekeepers or the API design review committee. And they're kind of this big important step. And before you get changes made uh, to the API or before your design is signed off, before you can start creating it or before new functionality is, is, is merged, however you do it, design first or code first, the design has to be approved by humans and you're still going to need that. But most of the work that those kind of gatekeepers are doing could easily be replaced by automation. You, you could easily have the same number of gatekeepers uh, handling a much larger number of APIs, or you could let a few of them get on with more interesting, important work um, while still being just as effective because um, pretty much 
a vast majority of those rules could be automated. All of the dictionary, all of the naming conventions, all of the, is it pluralized or not? That that all can be automated. But the review stuff that needs to be done um, by humans is like, does this make sense in our ecosystem? Um, do, do these words imply the correct meaning? Um, have we used the term account properly? Because there's uh, a different type of account over there, which means like company, but here account means like, uh, some potential sales thing. Um, and, and so you can have kind of humans really checking that you have a good API design um, uh, without, you know, without having to waste their time checking to see if you've pluralized things and have underscores and stuff like that. So um, yeah, if you use API design first, the real benefit is that you can have feedback on your API like as it's being designed, before it's being coded, before it's got to production, before it's even made it like into any sort of code. You you create this open API before you've built any of your code and you get feedback that that shapes and, and avoids problems that a lot of developers don't even know what they are. So um, yeah, then you've got it in CI. So the build's gonna fail if they don't follow your rules and you can you can add in new rules over time and, and kind of make APIs better over time as you add in more rules. So um, give it a try. There we go. I think uh, I think Maddie, we have a little bit of time for questions. Yeah, we're we're, we're we have two or let's say two or three minutes for questions because we have the the panel in ten minutes and for people to have a break. Uh, I, I have one question mostly about the uh, the the collaboration. So, how do you onboard enough stakeholders into engaging into writing API guidelines? So normally it's the um, the API champion or the um, kind of the, the API governance people, they'll just do it, right? If you're if you're enabling this on um, on continuous integration, then you only, you just need. In the past, I've talked to different teams and said like, "Hey, team one, team two, team three, do you want to do this?" Um, but the the world of kind of API governance tooling doesn't really exist yet. It's being worked on. It's on the roadmap for Stoplight. Um, at the moment, API governance is. You have a you have a CLI tool. You should run it and find out what happens. But in the future, it will be um, you know you can automatically enable this for for any APIs in your organization. Um, you will get reports from people who are breaking rules, and you can go and talk to them about like, hey, why did you turn these rules off? Um, this this sort of kind of API governance functionality will be pretty much used by the API governance teams, and it's the people who are manually doing it all right now can just stop manually doing it. They can kind of automate some of that work. So one question: Does this, does Spectral come with the base with the base set of rules you were referring to? Yep. Yeah. Built in, it's got some rules for async API and some rules for open API. They stay fairly unopinionated about your API specifically. So if you want to have rules about your API, I'm going to make my uh, APIs you won't hate rule set available. It'll be on the README um, when I get that pull request done. But um, yeah, it, it helps you write good open API. It just doesn't tell you how to write good APIs yet, if that makes sense. Yeah. Last one. Is there a feature parity, parity of Stoplight Studio and VS Code extension? For SL uh, Studio, Stoplight Studio. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So custom rule sets, custom rules, um, custom functions, all of that stuff. All of that stuff works. We keep them both up to date. Same with the GitHub Action. They're all they're all doing the same thing. Okay, last question before the panel we have in 10 minutes. Uh, when APIs you want hate to? <laughs> oh, yes. Um, I have kicked off the, we're going to open source it. Basically, um, in the last couple of years, since the last book, everything has changed. HTTP2 changed everything. Everything is completely different now. GraphQL popped up. There's a lot of different stuff to talk about. So I'm going to open source the efforts and get a whole bunch of developers in. And so if you're interested in helping me write build APIs you want hate to, um, swing, just talk to me on Twitter or, or anywhere. Um, and we can talk about it. So I'm going to give different chapters to different people, and then I'm just going to act as an editor instead of manually writing everything myself. Yeah, governing API books. Yeah, <laughs> API exactly. <laughs> right. See you in 10 minutes. So I stop Great. the broadcast, and we, we can go all in a break, and we talk to each other in 10 minutes. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. See you in 10 minutes, uh, folks, for the, the panel about API specifications. <laughs>